tumbling stock markets, rock bottom oil prices and some gloomy news from the US economy at the end of last year, 2016 has started with a whimper rather than a bang. The outlook for the year ahead is clouded by a shift towards negative sentiment. Are things really that bad? Well, I'm joined by Mike Jakeman from our global forecasting team to find out. Mike, markets, uh, currencies, commodities, stock markets, all down in many parts of the world. What's going on and what do we expect to happen next? Uh, yeah, it's been hard to make a profit anywhere so far uh, in 2016. Uh, the root cause of it is China. Uh, we saw another set of big falls on the, uh, the main Chinese stock markets at the beginning of the year. Um, we saw the return uh, to oil markets of Iran, uh, which sent commodity prices further down again, um, all of which had combined made a, uh, a really pessimistic tone to the, uh, the start of the year. Uh, we're not overly bothered about what's happening in the Chinese stock markets. Um, the Chinese markets are relative to those in the US and, and in Europe quite immature. And our China analyst likes to say that if you uh, want to play on the Chinese stock market, then you pretty much get what you deserve. Uh, by that, he means that uh, Chinese investors tend to display a kind of typical herd mentality. Um, and the, those, these stock markets are extremely volatile. Um, but when people start to make a correlation between the stock markets and, and GDP, um, I like to point out that in 2014, Chinese stocks grew by 100%. Uh, year on year. They were on an absolute tear, but the economy still slowed overall. So therefore, if you get a big fall, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get an even larger fall in, uh, in Chinese GDP. In fact, our, our Chinese forecast is uh, actually at now, I think, relatively bullish when we look at sort of what other people are suggesting, about 6.5% this year. Uh, and that's assuming uh, a slight bounce back uh, in the housing sector, which means investment should be a bit higher than it was last year. But overall, the sort of general theme with China is this you know, very gradual, ongoing shift from uh, low-cost manufacturing to a, a services economy. So uh, where does this leave us? Well, um, I'm, I don't think growth is going to be any faster in 2016 than it was in 2015, uh, but nor do I think we're heading into 1998 all over again. Okay, good. So that's one sort of worry that perhaps we can dispel slightly. And the other big thing that's been floating around, of course, part of the decline in equities has been in in the US, and some exalted figures out there have been talking about the imminence of another US recession. Should we be worried? I'm fairly sure we're not going to see a US recession this year, um, and I'll, I'll explain a few reasons why. Um, we saw some very poor industrial production numbers at the end of 2015, um, and the industrial sector, whilst still very important to the US economy, is now not big enough uh, to trigger a recession on its own. The US is a services-driven economy, and if the services sector continues to expand, which it, which it is doing, then I think that should be enough to insulate it from whatever effects you get in the industrial sector. Uh, another point is that uh, Q4 GDP, which was 0.7% uh, annualised, which is a big slowdown from the 4% or so we had in the middle of the year, um, was largely driven by the fact that inventories were drawn down in the quarter. And inventories, as US analysts know, play a really sort of outsized role in quarterly GDP. They get drawn down, which pulls the number down, and then you get restocking, which pushes it up a bit higher than it actually was. Um, and the other thing is that the US stock market fall, which we saw, I think was, as I suggested, largely driven by external events. Um, the most important indicator for the US economy remains the jobs number. Uh, and we saw some really, again, even more impressive uh, US job numbers at the end of last year. And I think that carries much more more weight for us. So we've got growth of about 2.5% in the US this year, which is the same as last year, and it's still predicated on government spending and particularly on households. These new people who are getting new jobs uh, and will increase their spending this year is what's going to power the US economy. Well, we can't leave the US without touching on Iowa, mm. I guess. Um, Ted Cruz trounced uh, Donald Trump. So I guess the question is, is it a KO for Trump? Well, I wouldn't say he trounced Trump. Um, I mean, Trump was the favourite, uh, and Cruz got 27%, Trump got 24%, and Marco Rubio got 21%. So I think this is, this is a, a good night for uh, Hillary Clinton on the Democrat side, who emerged with a, essentially a draw with Bernie Sanders when Sanders was expected to do better. Uh, in the nor Sanders supporters in the North, Clinton will eventually prevail over him, I think. Um, on the Republican side, it was a... a, a a very good night for Ted Cruz, who upset the balance um, by beating Trump. But it was a really good night for Rubio. Uh, the reason why is that 
uh, Rubio was sort of caught up in this race within a race with uh, several other sort of establishment candidates, John Kasich, Chris Christie, and Jeb Bush. Uh, none of those, those men got any, any sort of numbers uh, out of Iowa, whereas Rubio came a very creditable third. And that means that heading into New Hampshire and then beyond that into Super Tuesday, the pressure really is going to be on those three candidates to, to try and get some momentum from anywhere, because otherwise what will happen is the establishment will start to kind of put pressure on them to, to withdraw and to lend their, the, their supporters to Rubio. Um, so he's really in pole position from that race within a race. Um, and I think that there is no doubt that the establishment and the, the party grandees would much prefer Rubio as their candidate to either Cruz or Trump. Neither of those men poll very well when put against either Sanders or particularly against Clinton. Uh, so I think that uh, Iowa is a, uh, mostly a, a victory for Rubio, despite the fact that you know, he came third. Good. Um, let's move on to oil. Mm -hmm. uh, Saudi Arabia is sort of squeezing uh, the market, determined to hold on to market share and push out some of the sort of cheeky new entrants from uh, the US shale belt. Mm -hmm. Um, shale producers are, are still out there, they're still pumping, yep. uh, not as much as they were, but they're still there. So oil prices, as a result, are, are extremely low, uh, and it looks like they may stay there. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen a real squeeze on producers in the, last, in the last few weeks, and there was some speculation in the press last week of a potential uh, sort of quasi-OPEC deal involving Saudi and Russia agreeing to uh, reduce production. That is not going to happen. Um, this Saudi strategy of maintaining market share at all costs, in a sense, is working, I think. Um, it's taking a bit longer uh, than perhaps uh, many were expecting. Uh, we're going to see another round of financing for shale producers in April. And I think if we've said this before, but if prices stay this low, then it, you know, some of them are eventually going to feel the pain. Um, why haven't they done already? Well, shale is a new technology. There are efficiency gains to be made all the time. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's very responsive, it's very quick and uh, comparatively very cheap to do. Looking a bit further out, uh, the supply situation remains excellent. Um, we're going to see a, uh, Iran, as I mentioned, coming back into the market and supplying anything up to a million barrels in the next, uh, an extra million barrels a day over the next 18 months uh, into an already very well supplied market. Uh, we're going to see further increases in supply from uh, Iraq and from Libya. So supply remains excellent. Nevertheless, we think we're going to see some tightening of the market because finally, finally, uh, you know, I think two years of, of declining prices uh, will be enough to force out uh, some of the weaker shale producers. Uh, and also, we've had huge capital expenditure cuts, uh, something in the region now of $400 billion worth. And that is, that's going to show through somewhere. Uh, perhaps Canada, perhaps Brazil, you know, the, the Canada tar sands and, and offshore in Brazil are expensive places to, to produce oil from. Um, meanwhile, the, the, sort of the, the other side of the coin, the demand section, um, you know, demand was very good last year. I mean, partly that was opportunistic because the price was low. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you know, we still, you know, the world still needs oil and it sometimes gets forgotten in these discussions. Um, and while the economy continues to grow, uh, you know, we're going to see a lot of emerging market demand. So we think there is eventually going to be, in the second half of this year, the, the start of a very slow period of prices rising, but you know, nothing, nothing particularly spectacular. You know, we might get to you know, the late 40s, perhaps, if you're you know, really excited. Um, so we'll, we'll see some casualties, um, but we will also see the market start to tighten, I think. OK. Uh, the classical sort of traditional dynamic with, with periods of very low oil prices is that consumer countries uh, gain mm -hmm. um, big potential boost to consumption and uh, supplier countries lose out, uh, obviously, the, the export revenues and the, sure. and the fiscal revenues are, are, are all hit. It doesn't seem to be working out in quite that simple a way this time around. Am I right? And if well, so, why? Uh, so there's this theory uh, that was sort of commonly held to be true that for every $10 a barrel that comes off the oil price, uh, you'd get a tenth of a percentage point added to global GDP. So if you think about the maths of this, in 2015, the oil price fell from $100 a barrel to $50 a barrel. So in theory, we should have had a half a percentage point added to global GDP uh, last year. I don't really see that. Um, in fact, global GDP was pretty static in 2015 compared to 2014. It was sort of the same level. Um, we saw sort of bits here and there, I mean, evidence. Um, we saw some 
higher consumer spending in some European countries in the, you know, early on in the year. And we saw that the fact that Americans drove more miles and bought more cars than they ever have done before in 2015. But there still wasn't a clear statistical evidence for, for this. Um, and no one really knows why yet. Uh, I think one sort of plausible theory is that the energy sector in America is now much bigger than it was before. It's employing more people uh, as America becomes more energy independent. So it's, it's, you can understand the sort of theory that if more people work in the sector, then more people uh, and, and the sector suffers because of low prices, then more people lose their jobs and you know, the, the feed through into increased private spending is, is weaker. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to, to figure out. The other theory suggests that, that the IMF's theory about the, the 0.1% holds if you've got a sort of steady fall, mm. but if you have a sudden drop, as we've seen from, you know, it was only 18 months ago, the price was about 110, and now yeah. they're at 30 something. Um, that's actually destabilizing, you know, you get really swift investment cuts and job losses, and actually that perhaps levels it out. On the whole though, I mean, it, it stands to reason because the, the, this should be a big transfer of wealth to uh, households because the economies of oil importers US, China, Japan, India are much bigger than those of the exporters, you know, Saudi, Nigeria, Russia. So in theory, we should see somewhere this year some money being transferred, which should be good for the global economy. But I'd like to wait a couple more months before we can you know, identify exactly where it's coming through. Thank you, Mike. Well, that's it for this month. Please come again. Join us next month for another look at the global outlook. Thank you and goodbye.